Right now in the state, there are a total of 4,617 cases of COVID-19, an increase of 50 cases since yesterday. Of those cases, 4,145 are confirmed cases, an increase of 45, and 472 are probable cases, an increase of five. Overall across the state, 424 individuals have been hospitalized related to their illness with COVID-19. And right now, nine individuals are in the hospital, five of whom are in the ICU, one of whom is on a ventilator. Overall across the state, there have been 133 individuals who have passed away with COVID-19. This includes the passing of a man in his 70s from Somerset County, which was reported to Maine CDC yesterday. His passing marked the 133rd death associated with COVID-19 across the state. We offer his family, his friends, and his community our deepest condolences during this time of their grief. Since beginning our COVID-19 activation, 3,988 individuals have recovered, an increase of 10 recoveries since yesterday. And among our cases are 986 healthcare workers. I'd like to take a moment to provide a little bit of context around the 50 new cases that Maine CDC is reporting today. Of those cases, 18 of them are from York County, seven are from, from Penobscot County, 10 from Cumberland, and five from Androscoggin County. York County in particular remains a focus and an area of concern for all of us at Maine CDC. Just in the past two days, there have been at least 29 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in York County alone. 16, at least 16 of those cases have been associated with known outbreaks. And the other 13 at this time are thought to be related to community transmission. Now, of course, our investigation into those cases is ongoing, and we may later learn that they are in fact associated with an outbreak. But right now, at least 13 of those cases are from community transmission. As a reminder, that suggests that those individuals don't have any linkage to a known person with COVID-19 or with a known outbreak. That is strongly suggestive of strong, ongoing, sustained transmission of COVID-19 across York County. We've taken a closer look at the data in your, in your county. And just in the past few days, the age range of those who have been affected by COVID-19 spans from a low point of people in their 20s all the way up to people in their 70s. So this uptick of cases of COVID-19 in York County is not a phenomenon that's limited to long-term care facilities or even limited to congregate care settings. Moreover, the positivity rate in York County is now 1.8% over the past 14 days. That is three times higher than the statewide positivity rate. In addition, the rate of new cases of COVID-19 in York County over the past 14 days is now 7.5 cases for every 10,000 people of new cases just in the past 14 days, 7.5. To put that number in perspective, the statewide average of new cases over the last two weeks is 2.75 for every 10,000 people. We've also taken a close look at the onset dates of illness for the recent cases we've had in York County. And what they tell us is that transmission is continuing and occurring with an increasing frequency in York County. When we look at when individuals are getting sick, they're not telling us that they were sick three or four weeks ago and just happened to have gotten tested. Instead, they're telling us that they first started getting sick two or three or four days ago, not two or three or four weeks ago. Right now across the state, about half of the outbreaks that Maine CDC is involved with are in York County across the entire state. About half of the outbreaks are centered in York County. 
And one of the things that we've learned over the last six months of working with outbreaks of COVID-19, no outbreak is an island. What this really outbreaks are not isolated events. One outbreak can quickly lead to several more outbreaks, especially in a close geographic area. Moreover, the outbreaks of recent days and weeks in York County have affected numerous areas of community life, workplaces, universities, and churches. All of this means that there is now strong evidence that the virus is with us and in certain parts of the state, like in York County, has resulted in sustained widespread transmission. For that reason, York County in particular remains an area of high concern and high focus for all of us at Maine CDC right now. I'd like to take a moment to provide an update on some of the outbreaks that Maine CDC is working on, speaking of outbreaks. Well, let's start with an overview of the outbreaks that have emanated from the wedding in Millinocket that was almost one month ago now. Right now, there are 144 cases associated in some way, shape or form with that August 7th wedding. 56 of those cases are wedding guests and their secondary or tertiary contacts. contacts. One of the cases is someone who is a secondary contact of a guest who also happens to be a staff member at Maplecrest. In addition to that individual at Maplecrest, there are 15 additional cases at that facility. Eight of them are among residents and seven, among, some, seven of them are among staff. When including that one individual from the wedding, that now results in a total of 16 cases at Maplecrest. In addition, there was one member of the York County Jail staff who attended the wedding in Millinocket. In addition to that one individual at the York County Jail, there are now 18 additional staff members who have tested positive, 46 inmates who have tested positive at the York County Jail, and seven family members of staff who now have confirmed COVID-19 infections. All told, again, 144 cases of COVID-19 either directly or indirectly linked to the events of the Millinocket wedding on August 7th. Let's take a closer look at the York County Jail right now. As I mentioned a moment ago, there are now 72 total cases associated with the jail. 46 of them are among inmates. That's an increase of eight new cases among inmates just in the past 24 hours. Well, what's been concerning to Maine CDC is that these, new, these eight new cases among inmates are in a different part of the jail an area of the jail where there had not previously been cases. Also, there are, as I mentioned a moment ago, 19 total staff members associated with the jail and the county building. And again, seven family members who are close contacts of staff who have now tested positive. One note, there have also been 10 family members that we identified yesterday as probable cases who have now tested negative. We continue to work with the York County Jail. Retesting is ongoing and we anticipate receiving additional sets of laboratory samples up here at our lab in Augusta as the jail continues subsequent rounds of testing. As always, our concern level remains high for this as well as all outbreaks and we continue to remain engaged with officials at the jail. Another outbreak in York County that we are tracking and working on very closely is that associated with the Sanford Calvary Baptist Church, where there are now 10 cases of COVID-19. That's an increase of five cases since yesterday. One note for everyone, the five new cases associated with the Calvary Baptist Church are not reflected in today's case count. They will, however, be reflected in tomorrow's case count. We've been in regular communication with the pastor of this church. In fact, just this morning, we sent a letter to the pastor recapping our public health recommendations and outlining our expectations of compliance around those recommendations. 
We've offered not just recommendations, but also assistance in obtaining things like face coverings and connecting parishioners and congregants, as well as others who may have been at the church with our contact tracing program. Speaking of contact tracing, I'd like to take a moment to talk a little bit more about contact tracing, how it works, what it is, and what it is not and really walk through why and how it is the bedrock of public health outbreak investigation. To be frank, one of the most common questions that we get is how contact tracing works. So I'd like to take the opportunity and take a second of everyone's time today to pull back that curtain a little bit. When we think about contact tracing, there are two key questions that we are trying to answer. The first, is where did folks get COVID-19 from? The second is who might they have given it to? Contact tracing is what allows us to answer those questions. Maine CDC right now has nearly 100 people who are working on our contact tracing effort right now. So let's start by talking about what contact tracing is. And simply put, Contact tracing is just talking with folks. It's simply talking to people to see how they're doing. Nothing more, nothing less. It's you talking with the main CDC epidemiologist and the main CDC epidemiologist checking in with you. Main CDC epidemiologist will ask you, for example, who you were in contact with prior to getting sick. That helps us answer the first question where you might have gotten the disease. But the epidemiologist will also talk to you about who you were in contact with after you got sick. That helps us answer the second question, who might you have given the disease to? I wanna be really clear. These are 100% private conversations. Confidentiality remains of paramount importance, even in a pandemic. So if you test positive for COVID-19, and you provide us a list of every one of your close contacts from the time period when you might have been spreading the disease around, we're going to reach out to those folks. But we will not tell any of those people who gave us their name or phone number. If you're a positive case, your, your identity, your confidentiality remains shrouded in secrecy. We use the information that we generate from these conversations, from these contacts, to identify things like outbreaks. So when a lot of people report to us that they were at the same gathering, at the same time, in the same place, with the same people, that clues us in that there might be, going, there might be something going on. In addition to helping us identify these outbreak situations, contact tracers are there to help you. They'll help you monitor yourself for symptoms. They'll help you stay safe at home. They'll help you get other assistance with everything, everyday things like getting food and making sure you've got a safe place to stay if you need that assistance. It's equally important though, to talk about what contact tracing is not. And the bottom line here is that contact tracing is not location tracking. It is purely talking with folks to learn about who you yourself have been in contact with. It is not location tracking. So how would a main CDC contact tracer reach out to you? Well, primarily we'll reach out to you by phone. And when we call you, contact tracers will provide their name. Their, they will note their affiliation with main CDC and they'll provide you with their phone number. In addition, We've also worked with cell phone providers in Maine. And so if you see on your cell phone a missed call that says on the caller ID, Maine CDC, that's likely to be a contact tracer. It should also provide you with a little bit more security that when you see Maine CDC pop up on your phone, it's someone who wants to chat with you because you could have been exposed to COVID-19. If you tested positive, for COVID-19, 
a contact tracer will work with you to identify your close contacts. Anyone who was in six feet of you for at least 15 minutes in the days leading up to when you had symptoms. We'll ask for their phone numbers, as well as anyone else you tell us about, so that we can call them and provide care for them. Well, now, we're gonna also encourage you to let your contacts know about your illness, but if you don't, that's okay. We'll call those contacts to let them know that they've been maybe been exposed, but we will not reveal your identity to them. If you happen to be staying home during your period of isolation, the contact tracer will discuss any needs that you might have and work to connect you with additional supports if you need them. So let me talk a little bit about what a contact tracer is gonna do. To ensure that you have the care that you need and the support to stay safe, a contact tracer is gonna ask you to confirm your date of birth your address and other, data, other basic information. If you're a positive case, they're gonna discuss any symptoms you might've had, whether you were hospitalized and whether you've got any underlying health conditions that might put you at greater risk. They're also gonna ask about some details around your living situation so they can provide you information about how to stay safe and avoiding infecting other people in your household. But let me be really clear about what a contact tracer is never going to do. Contact tracing, again, is not location tracking. So Maine CDC is never going to track your cell phone. And we're never going to follow your GPS location. Indeed, we don't have access to it. Second, confidentiality matters. So if you're a case of COVID-19, your name is never gonna be released or revealed to your contacts. Also, a contact tracer is never gonna ask you about your immigration status. And a contact tracer is never gonna ask you for your social security number. And a contact tracer is never gonna ask for any financial information like your bank or your credit card number. The bottom line here, is that main CDC contact tracers are never gonna give you up. They're never gonna let you down. They're never gonna run around and desert you. Main CDC contact tracers are never gonna make you cry. They're never gonna say goodbye. And they're never gonna tell a lie and hurt you. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to our colleagues in the media today. And our first question today goes to Brad Rogers. Uh, hi, Dr. Shaw. How you doing? Uh, hey, Brad. Doing okay. I was curious, okay. I was curious um, what have you been told about the protocols at the York County Jail uh, that, that you were or were not using at the, you know, doing at the time of this outbreak or leading up to this outbreak? Yep, uh, Brad, I've, I've participated on a number of those calls. Um, you know, we, we've, we've, uh, it, it appears that up until the time uh, that the first case was identified, uh, wearing of face masks or face coverings was not what it should have been. Um, we have worked with the jail subsequent to that to make sure that they've got the right recommendations in place, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for things like face coverings. And we've also worked with them to furnish those face coverings so they've got an ample and adequate supply of them on hand. Uh, we're continuing to work with the jail to make sure we can help them put infection control measures in place to continue limiting the spread. Although, as I noted, some of the recent cases among inmates have been a, in a part of a jail where there had not previously been cases. So our concern level is high. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn now to Patty White at Maine Public. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, you said that you're in uh, having regular communication with the pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church. Are you able to have verbal communication or, or has it shifted to just written communication? Um, I have not spoken or we have, uh, we have not spoke, but to me, let me make sure. Uh, the last time I personally spoke with the pastor was this past Friday. Um, other members of my team have been in contact with him, partly uh, over the phone, but also uh, in writing as well. 
And have you established a link between that outbreak and the wedding in Millinocket? Not a direct link, although that is a focus of our investigation through the contact tracing uh, that we've talked about. Um, before we can declare that there is a link and be solid in our declaration of such, we've got to make sure that everyone who may have been involved uh, is in fact a confirmed case. We've got to make sure that the timelines match up and we have to make sure that their exposures were sufficient so that disease may have actually been transmitted. Those are some of the elements that go into establishing that linkage. Right now, that's what that's really one of the areas of our investigation. Great, and I've got just one other question, um, kind of related to a discussion on Tuesday about the state's um, enforcement authority over churches. Uh, Commissioner Lambrou said that under the civil state of emergency that DHHS can step in to protect public health if there's an activity that puts people in harm's way. And I was just curious, does the same apply to private religious schools? If they're not following safety guidelines, can the state step in? And if so, what can it do? Yep, it, it's a highly fact-specific inquiry, as, as you would imagine, Patty. Um, but in general, where there are concerns about public health, we always attempt to work with organizations, uh, not against them. That being said, our expectation when Maine CDC at least offers public health guidance, our expectation is that organizations comply with that guidance. Now, separate and apart from that collaborative process with Maine CDC, there are other sources of authority. Some of them lie with the attorney general's office, some as you noted with DHHS, some with the governor's office itself, depending on the situation. Depending on what we see in any situation, be it a religiously affiliated school or any other private organization, uh, depending on what we see, that kind of calibrates what type of enforcement activity we take. I can't give you a, a, a firm answer about, for example, in a school, what route we would take. It really does depend on what the facts are and what the nature of the violations is. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Joe Lawler at the Press Herald next. Uh, yes, hi. Um, I have a, 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 a couple questions about the um, about the, the news that there would be a, a talk about a vaccine being put into production by uh, early November. Um, what would the main CDC do uh, to um, prepare for that distribution? And um, are, are you concerned at all about the vaccine being rushed into production uh, before it's ready? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, Joe, um, let me say a couple of things. The first is uh, ever since ooh, May, maybe late April, Maine CDC, yeah, since late April, uh, Maine CDC has been working in parallel with our outbreak response activities. We've simultaneously been planning for the arrival of any particular COVID-19 vaccine. And I, I think we started that work in earnest in, in late April. So uh, going on four months now, four and a half. Uh, our focus in that work is on a couple of things. The first is, of course, administration of the vaccine, how we get it out to healthcare providers, or, for example, how our own public health nurses might be engaged in the administration of the vaccine. Uh, the second is around uh, receipt and handling of the vaccine. The U.S. CDC has announced that all vaccine production will be diverted to the U.S. CDC, and the U.S. CDC will, will then subsequently ship it to states. So we've got to have a logistics operation in place that can receive massive amounts of vaccine and then ship it out to hospitals, healthcare providers, et cetera. And then the third thing that we've been working on is data. But this is going to be a massive effort and we've got to track exactly who's getting the vaccine, when they're getting it. Because for example, if you get, dose, if you get a dose of a vaccine of vaccine A, you've got to get the exact same dose of dose number two either 21 or 28 days later. You can't mix and match. So we've got to make sure we've got an IT system that helps us keep keep all of that straight. Uh, so that work has been ongoing for four plus months now via our immunization program. Um, and we, we've, been, we've been ramping up that effort uh, many fold in the past few weeks. The letter that you referenced from C US CDC Director Redfield uh, to state health officials and governors really really was focused on the distribution piece and making sure that states have their distribution elements in place as soon as of, of November 1st. That's again, been a key focus of ours. 
you ask about concerns over any rush around a vaccine. And the bottom line is that I would be concerned in that situation. We've all read reports that that rush may occur. It's too early to judge what might happen. But what I will say, in this situation, if the US FDA were to proceed with an abbreviated process and approve a vaccine through the emergency use authorization, I think that would raise concerns. In and of its face, there is the inherent risk of approving and releasing a vaccine before full completion of the phase three trials. There are, of course, the attendant concerns that that would have around erosion of faith and confidence in the public health system. There are also smaller but equally important concerns around how this would just crater participation in phase three trials. Why participate in a trial if the vaccine is down the street and available? Uh, it also raises harder questions around whether individuals might say, well, hey, I got a vaccine now, I don't need to engage in mask wearing. So I would have concerns if that route were followed. It's too early to say which route will be followed, but that's how my colleagues and I across the other 49 states are thinking about this. If I could just very quickly follow up on the um, on the pastor at Calvary Baptist Church. I know you said you sent a letter um, and that your staff has been in communication with him. Has, um, he, has he been cooperative uh, to your knowledge about wanting to uh, follow the uh, public health recommendations? Uh, we've had good communication uh, with the pastor and he's been responsive, but we also need to make sure that it's more than just communication we're having. We need to make sure that the communication is coupled with responsive action. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Allison Ross at WMTW. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you so much for taking my question. So actually going along the lines of the previous question back to what, when or if that vaccine is ready by November. So you kind of touched on this before, but then what would be the pecking order for who would get that vaccine first? Are we talking about first responders or would it be other frontline workers? And then who is kind of lower down the list of that? Great. So Allison, um, in this respect, what we've been doing is, is following and in many cases participating in the national conversation that is being had via the National Academy of Science. Uh, they have been tasked with helping to at least kick off the conversation about that prioritization system scheme ordering that you noted. Uh, just a couple of days ago, actually, the National Academy's working group on this matter released a preliminary draft report. It's publicly available. And what they outlined was a system under which the very first folks who would be getting the vaccine in the first phase of distribution would be many of the groups that you noted, Allison. This would be frontline healthcare workers. Uh, this would be individuals who work in and who are residents of long-term care facilities. And this would be groups like first responders. Uh, those, in, in phase one of the vaccine, there will be far more demand than there is supply. And so one of the difficult questions is who's going to be closer to the front of the line? And at least the initial draft from the National Academy suggested those groups. Once those groups have been vaccinated and are able to continue providing care for people, which is of course their daily job, then there's a secondary group. This is groups like uh, critical infrastructure workers, uh, folks of that nature who are equally important in keeping our society going. And then as you go through and as vaccine availability ramps up, more and more and more individual groups would be invited to get in line to make sure that they can get the vaccine. No final decisions have been made at the state level or at the national level. It's part of an ongoing conversation. And uh, I, I speculate, I guess, I, I hypothesize that one of the things that we're all gonna be talking about over the next several weeks and months is this exact question of how is vaccine gonna be distributed and when are folks going to be getting it? Um, I'm gonna turn now to Evan Pop at the main beacon. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, so my question is about schools. Um, so a draft of the standard operating procedure for schools was uh, released recently um, and states that since school staff are considered essential workers, um, even if they are in close contact uh, with a confirmed case, they may uh, return to work so long as there are no um, substitute school staff available, the school members take appropriate infection control uh, precautions. 
including the use of PPE, and the staff remain in quarantine outside of work. So I'm wondering um, what thinking went into that specific part of the draft, um, and could that part be revised later on based on the possible impacts um, of allowing staff members to return? Sure. So Evan, it is a it is a draft document. We put it out there for the very purpose that, that for the discussions that we're having right now. Uh, we want folks to get a sense of what we're thinking right now before uh, we start having cases, let alone the potential for outbreaks in schools. As a result, any part of that document could be modified based on feedback as well as evolving science around the management of COVID-19. With respect to teachers, um, ever since the early days of the outbreak of the pandemic, um, there has been a doctrine developed for so-called essential workers, those who are essential, vital to keeping things going. And employees who fall under one of the essential worker designations can, not must, but can go back to their job if they've been exposed provided they have on PPE and other safeguards to reduce the likelihood that they may expose others. This is if they've been exposed, not if they're a confirmed case, but if they've been exposed. So it's going to be a balance. All of this guidance document says is that if a school official in their judgment determines that the teacher cannot be out of the classroom because the implications on classroom education, the impact on that would be too great they have the option, not the requirement, but the option of having that teacher remain in the classroom provided they've got all the appropriate PPE and other safeguards. It's not a requirement, it's an option. The ultimate decision will be one that school officials will have to make based on the operational considerations at the school itself. We at Maine CDC, of course, will be standing by to help them operationalize what their decision is. Could that guidance be changed? Most certainly. If the categorization of teachers as essential workers were to change at the federal level, it could change. But we are keeping tabs on that. This is our current thinking. Depending on how the outbreak management unfolds, that document itself may change. Um, and, and just to, to follow up on that, is there any sort of um, timeline for turning um, that from a draft into sort of a final document, or is that just an ongoing um, conversation as as you see how things go in schools? It's it's a little bit of both. Um, right now, we're finalizing our, 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 our meetings with the Department of Education around taking that draft stamp off the document so that it can be a, a, an actual um, document that is in effect. But at the same time, as you'll note on that document in the upper, in the very first page, there's a box that says revised on. We, an, we anticipate because this is a scientific endeavor, what we know today about the management of COVID-19, as well as the impact of COVID-19 on children, what we know today will not be the same as what we know next week. And so we design SOPs to account for and allow for that changing science. That's why right on the top of that document, we note that there is the, there, there will be revisions to it and we provide a space so that everyone is aware when and how this document has changed. So it's going to be a document that we continue to update as the US CDC and others in the scientific community develop a deeper understanding about COVID-19 in schools. Thank you. You bet, I'm gonna to turn to Emily Tadlock at WABI. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thanks so much for taking my questions. Um, I have three different ones today. Um, the first one is with York County being such a concern uh, for the CDC, is there talk of putting certain restrictions in place again? Um, Emily, there, so you know the way that we think about outbreaks is that all options are on the table. Um, right now, that's not where we're focused on. Uh, that's not the top thing that we're going to. Uh, uh, that's, of course, always on the list of potential policy options. But frankly, there are other options that we look to first, like more aggressive contact tracing, equipping more folks with PPE, encouraging greater use of face coverings and physical distancing. Those are the things that we think and it, science has shown get a better bang for the buck with respect to tamping down on COVID-19 in different places. Uh, all options are on the table, but we have to think about where we're going to get the most efficacy for anything, any single activity we undertake. And the things that I outlined a moment ago, 
contact tracing, more widespread use of PPE, making sure that everyone's got a face covering so they can wear one. Those are the things that we know will have a greater impact right now. Okay, the next question comes from our sports reporter. Um, when exactly were approved guidelines created by the NBA for fall sports out of compliance with state community sports guidelines before or after the September 1st update? That is a good question. Um, I believe it, you know what, I'm not 100% sure. I, b I believe it was before, but I'm gonna just confirm to make sure that my understanding comports with the, the timeline of the MPA. So we'll make sure I get. I'll, we'll make sure we get back to you on that. Um, you know, I think more generally, um, our, our, the approach right now is as we think about school sports. I think the thinking is let's make sure we get the school part down pat before we go into the sports part. Uh, let's get things like homeroom down. I think we can all agree that making sure that the fundamentals are in place is really the right step right now. Um, I, I, as the way I think about it is that we should really be making sure we can walk before we run, both literally and metaphorically in this case. Okay, and last question. The US CDC is relaxing some of its travel guidance. Um, is there any possibility that we'll be relaxing some here, allowing more states to be exempt and people, more people coming in? Um, so Emily, we uh, uh, several on a weekly basis, if not multiple times per week, are taking a look at the data around COVID-19, not just in our state, not just in our counties, but across the across the country, specifically with respect to the Northeast. Uh, we took a look at the data not too long ago, and at that time, there were no other states in the Northeast that met the epidemiological criteria for being allowed to come to Maine without having a test or having quarantined. Those criteria, again, being that they are as safe, if not safer, than the situation in Maine right now. We still encourage visitors from those states to come to Maine, and as testing availability has increased in places like Massachusetts and Rhode Island, we hope, we believe they'll be able to get a test before they come. So there's not a barrier, but we also wanna make sure we'll simultaneously keeping Maine people safe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn now to Charlie at the BDN. Hey, Charlie, you with us today? All right, I'll turn next to Amy Brown at WERU and come back to Charlie. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, following up on the enforcement questions back and back to the Calvary Church outbreak, does the state's enforcement authority only come into play when some a gathering has exceeded the recommended number of people for that space or uh, as in at the Cal Calvary Church, if there were fewer than the number of people who were allowed to gather, but they were close together and having choir practice and not wearing masks, does the state step in, does it have the authority to step in and enforce that part of the executive orders as well? Uh, so, Amy, there, there are multiple routes through which enforcement could be effectuated. I don't want to speculate as to what we might do in any particular situation, and certainly not with respect to any particular entity. Uh, that, again, is heavily fact-dependent, as, as, we as I was talking about with Patty White, uh, very fact-specific. So I, I don't want to speculate or uh, opine on hypotheticals. What I will say is that any of the mechanisms that you outlined, uh, given that they are noted and, and part of Governor Mills's executive orders, uh, they, they do constitute the basis for enforcement, whether it is the gathering limit, which stands at 50 people indoors or 100 people outdoors, or the requirement to wear face coverings or the requirement to maintain physical distance. If those requirements are not abided, uh, they are almost per se violations of the executive order. Uh, the conditions under which enforcement is appropriate Again, highly fact specific, but on their own, they would constitute violations of the executive order. Then it becomes a question of where we go from there. Okay, just to follow up to that, and then I have a, another unrelated question. Is anyone continuing to monitor the situation with the church services there and also the situation in jails across the state where prisoners are potentially being exposed to this mm -hmm. you know, very deadly disease and don't really have any 
recourse for that right now? Sure, with respect to the churches, our expectation when we work with any owner, operator, manager uh, of any facility, whether it's a restaurant, a construction site, a church or a healthcare facility, we have a strong expectation of compliance. We set the boundaries of what is best for public health. We put those recommendations in writing in most cases, and we then expect compliance. Um, that is our expectation, not just in the setting of a church, but no matter the setting, we expect compliance. Uh, with respect to correctional facilities, uh, although Maine CDC is involved there, uh, respectfully there, Amy, I, I, would, I would ask that you check in with the Department of Corrections. They're a lot more closely related in, in, uh, with respect to what's going on at jails and, and prisons across the state. Uh, they would have the primary eyes on what's going on in those facilities. Okay. And given the high percentage of people who attended that wedding, I think it's a, approximately half of the people who are in attendance who contracted COVID and how quickly it spread. Is there any chance that this is a diff different, stronger strain of COVID? Is the CDC or anyone monitoring what of the different variants of COVID we have in the state? We are working uh, with the Jackson Laboratory to undertake a genetic analysis of samples of COVID positive individuals from Maine so we can compare the genetic makeup of the virus or viruses that are circulating in Maine against those that are circulating across the globe. But what we what is more likely to have happened on the August 7th wedding is that one or more individuals, likely to be more than one individual, came to the wedding already positive with COVID. And so rather than this being one individual, it was likely to be more than one individual. And those that, that panel of folks are likely to have spread the disease more widely, more, more uh, efficiently in this case, than it had it been just one person. That's our hypothesis right now. And it seems to line up with the onset date of symptoms that people experience. It's very difficult to get to 100% certainty in these situations, but that's how we, that's how epidemiology sort of backs into what we believe to be the strongest inference. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna go back to Charlie. Are you with us? I, I am, thanks Dr. Shaw. Yeah, my call dropped before for some reason. Um, so um, my first question is about the York County Jail today. The um, county manager there talked a little bit about the outbreak and he said that um, they have been putting infected inmates sort of in one unit of the jail in, in um, isolated cells. And then people who may have been exposed to them, inmates who may have been exposed to them in a, a separate unit in single and double cells. And I, I, just because you mentioned that there has now been cases detected in other units of the jail, do you know if it was that area where possible cases were being isolated, or do you have any additional information about where in the jail that was? Um, Charlie, at this time, so we, we just learned of these additional cases from the la our laboratory uh, just maybe five or six hours ago. So uh, as part of our investigation process, or contact tracing process, we now will, of course, go back to these additional cases and figure out exactly where within the jail they were and where they were housed. But what our very initial investigation revealed is that they were not in the part of the jail where individuals who were positive or exposed were being housed. That is to say, they were in a part of the jail where there had not been known cases or exposures. More investigation is needed there, Charlie. I wanna be really clear, that is not a definitive conclusion, that's a preliminary conclusion. Uh, that's one of the things our epidemiologists are working with the jail officials on today to shore up and get a better understanding of. But I think it's, it's illustrative of the fact that COVID-19 is an opportunistic virus. And despite the best attempts to place individuals into cohorts and eliminate inter, any intermingling among them, there's still the possibility that the virus can be an unintended guest or piggyback onto somebody and introduce itself into new areas. More investigation is still needed though, Charlie, uh, and we'll, we'll probably have some updates on that. Maybe not today, but probably early next week. Okay, and um, uh, sort of in another part of the um, 
related to the wedding outbreak, uh, we saw from just the regular reports from Maine CDC that there was a, a person from Somerset County who, who died of COVID related reasons on uh, at some point in the last few days. And um, it, was that death, was that a person, a resident or staff member of Maple Crest Rehabilitation? Um, Charlie, I, I'm not able to confirm that for reasons of patient privacy. Um, what I will tell you is that there are now two deaths that have been associated with the Millinocket wedding. Okay. For, for privacy reasons, I, I can't say more than that. Um, okay, you can't say anything about where that second reported death happened or anything like that? Unfortunately not. Uh, all, all I can say is that there was a man in his 70s from Somerset County. That I'm sorry, that was, um, oh, you're saying that was the second death in the wedding outbreak or, or just that there was a, a man of that age in Somerset County who died? Uh, both actually. So it, okay, so uh, I'm sorry, I just want to ask that another way to make it more clear. So was there a man in his 70s from Somerset County who died in connection to the wedding outbreak? Yes. Okay, thank you. You bet. Um, I'm gonna turn next to Dustin at New England Cable News. Hi, right, Dr. Shaw. First off, can you give this situation in York County and overall in the state right now some context, both in how it's affecting Maine's overall COVID-19 situation? And then also your concern level, has it been higher at some point this year than it is right now? Um, so for context, Dustin, you know, it is uh, the situation in York County is driving many of the, is driving much of what we are seeing in our numbers across the state. Uh, so I, I think I mentioned, um, if, if I didn't, I'll, I'll go over them again. Of the 50 cases today, 18 of them are from York County, whereas seven are from, are from Penobscot, 10 from Cumberland, five from Androscoggin, and the remainder scattered across the state. So right now, just for today, let alone the past week or two, um, what, we, what we see happening in York County with about half of the outbreaks that are currently open and active in the state being centered in, in York County, what we're seeing is a situation of multifocal outbreaks within a small geographic area that in and of themselves are generating a high number of cases. In addition to that, those outbreaks are also generating community transmission. Individuals may be, uh, may be associated with those outbreaks, be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, and then unknowingly infect other people in their lives who then also test positive but as far as they are aware, have no known connection because they may have they may have picked up COVID from one of these intermediate carriers. Uh, as again, as I mentioned, just in the past two days, there have been 29 cases and about 13 of those cases don't seem to have any linkage to a known outbreak. So um, a lot of what we're seeing in the state right now is being generated by York County's outbreaks and their increase in cases. You ask about my concern level. Um, you know what, what I what I would say is, you know, Dustin, there there have been times uh, thus far during COVID where my concern level has been equally high, if not maybe even greater. Um, uh, certainly, when we were contending with situations that were generating a high number of fatalities, uh, going back to some prominent outbreaks at nursing homes and memory care facilities. Those, of course, exact more of a human toll and thus raise all of our concerns as well as our sorrows. What concerns me a bit about York County, however, is the disseminated nature of the outbreaks. They're spread essentially over a county as opposed to a nursing facility, which is discrete and generally more contained. Uh, I am concerned that if we do not get a grip on what's going on in York County, it has the potential to spiral and start affecting adjacent parts of the state in the not too distant future. And then what's your message for people within Maine, outside of Maine traveling 
but for Labor Day weekend, your county has a lot of beaches. Should anyone be taking any extra precautions going into that area? It's going to be nice tomorrow, for instance. Yeah, uh, you know, Dustin, um, the, my message for folks who are wanting to come to Maine or travel within Maine is please do so. It's, it's going to be a glorious weekend. I'm going to talk about Labor Day in just a second, but we want you to come here. Uh, if you're from a state where there's not a travel exemption, we want you to get a negative test. But you asked Dustin about whether there are special or extra precautions that need to be taken for folks visiting York County. And the answer is that the same precautions that we have talked about apply with equal force, whether in your, whether you are in your county or another part of the state. Those are things like making sure you're wearing a face covering and introducing physical distance between you and your pod and anyone else that's out there. What science has shown with respect to COVID-19 over the past several months is that those two things, coupled with hand washing, but really truly face coverings coupled with physical distance are two of the strongest pieces that we've got in our armamentarium to reduce transmission of COVID-19. You don't need to do more than that. You just need to follow both of those things plus good hygiene principles to a T. Everyone were to do that, we could get a grip on COVID-19, not just statewide, not just your county, but nationwide. And so for anyone who's planning to go down to your county, this weekend, in fact, my family and I were talking about where we were going to go hiking this weekend, and Mount Agamenticus was on our list. Our view is to make sure when we do that, to keep face coverings on and keep distance. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Joe at ABC7. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Um, my question revolves around yesterday, the Portland Pie Company pizza shop in Bangor closed down because they uh, said that they had one confirmed positive case. And I was just wondering if you had any more information around that. I know it's only been 24 hours, but they did say they were in contact with you. And also that and uh, on the Facebook post, their response to one of the questions was the employee hasn't worked there in a week. Can you give us a clarified timeline on when the last time they worked? Uh, sure, Joe. So we, 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 when we start working with facilities, it's generally when they've reached outbreak status. We work with individuals prior to them being in an outbreak status. So we would be working with the individual employee in this situation, not so much the facility. Uh, I can't comment on any individual patient related data about when they may have worked or when their last day at work was. Uh, what I will tell you is that uh, restaurants across Maine, in this case, including the Portland Pie Company, have followed best public health principles to reduce the likelihood of introducing COVID-19 to any of their customers. But unfortunately, Joe, I, I can't really comment um, anything more on individual cases. Thank you. Yep, you bet, Dustin. Uh, I'm going to turn to Kate Koff at the Ellsworth American. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, so my first question is can you uh i think you said 986 healthcare workers are among the uh, confirmed cases can you give us a breakdown of that at all you know are are these largely you know physicians or are they ambulance workers are they cnas do you have any information on that Sure, Kate, we can get you a bit, a bit more of a granular breakdown of who is encompassed within uh, our definition of healthcare worker. One of the things that I want to note when we think about healthcare workers and COVID-19, um, the question to keep in mind is whether the healthcare workers got COVID-19 as part of their work as a healthcare worker or whether they got it in the community and thus could have potentially exposed others. So when we think about healthcare workers, the reason we are concerned is for the possibility of both, that a healthcare worker could be getting infected as part of their job, but also that they could have been infected in the community and completely unknowingly introduced it into a facility. That's why we pay such close attention to them. Again, we can get you a better breakdown of what we deem and who we consider to be healthcare workers. Thank you. Um, and then my second question is, um, so there were some reports uh, out of New York during their height of, the height of the outbreak there that it was some basically bureaucratic red tape um, that prevented 
people who needed to be transferred between hospitals from from being transferred. Um, and I'm just I'm wondering, you know, thankfully, we're not um, that's not the case here. We are not seeing a surge in cases right now. But if we do see a surge of cases in the fall and the winter, are there contracts and is there a plan in place to make sure that patients who need to be transferred you know, between hospitals that may not be affiliated with one another, um, can, you know, that that can happen smoothly? Sure, Kate. So the answer is that that has not happened in Maine. It did not happen in Maine. And because of the planning that we've done since the beginning of the year, we don't anticipate that it would happen in Maine. Uh, We've worked very closely with emergency medical personnel, as well as hospitals, as well as with nursing homes, so that if patients need to be transferred to a higher acuity facility, or across facilities, we've got the system in place to make sure that happens. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna turn now to Patrick Whittle at the AP. Thank you very much. Um, wanted to make certain I uh, followed some numbers correctly. The, the Sanford outbreak has grown from five to 10, is that correct? Correct, Patrick. Okay, great. And, um, and sorry, Patrick, sorry to cut you off. That's the- please. Outbreak associated with the Calvary Baptist Church only. Right, yeah, that, I should have been more specific about that. Um, is, there, is there anything more you can tell us about the state's investigation into, uh, into, what's, into what's going on there and its, its overlap with the, other, with the other cases? And also, I'm curious if you have any, uh, any thoughts on the investigation that York County opened up into the, into the jail outbreak and what we could potentially learn from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll start with the church. Um, right now, Patrick, we're, our, the focus of our investigation, well, there are many foci, but one of them, of course, is to try to get a better understanding of how COVID could have been introduced into that church community and, and whether it was in any way related to the, the events uh, at the Millinocket wedding on August 7th. We've got hypotheses, but we, we don't, we're not there yet in terms of announcing a linkage. Uh, the other focus of the investigation is on the contact tracing piece. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to encourage anyone who is a member or who has visited the Calvary Baptist Church in Sanford, uh, if you believe you may have been in contact with somebody, uh, please do two things. The first is reach out to the main CDC. You may have already been given or listed as a contact, as I talked about when I talked about our contact tracing process. And if so, you're probably already in touch with the contact tracer. But if not, we'd like to work with you so we can keep you safe and healthy. Uh, So those are the two areas of focus right now in our investigation, Patrick. Again, it's kind of the same schema writ large. Where did the virus come from and who might it have been transmitted to? Uh, With respect to the investigation, you noted, Patrick, uh, I'm aware of that announcement, but don't have anything further to say or comment on. Uh, and the final question of the afternoon goes to Bob Evans from News Center. Thank you, Dr. Shah. I have uh, two questions. You mentioned providing masks and equipment to the York County Jail earlier. With the new area of the jail now having outbreaks, how can the jail continue to have more cases if they're following the state's recommendation? Uh, and is enough being done at the jail, do you believe? to uh, stop the spread of the disease? Oh, that's, that's certainly the focus of our investigation, Bob. Uh, we, we wanna make sure that everything that can be done is recommended and that every recommendation is coupled with the resources to put it into place. In this situation, uh, we've gotta make sure we've got a better sense of the timeline of when individuals, the, especially these newest cases, could have been exposed and where they were in the jail. It's possible, and again, as I was talking about with Charlie, we've got to know whether these individuals were those who had already been exposed, and thus it might not be surprising that they've now developed COVID-19, or alternately, were they in a part of the jail where there had been no exposures whatsoever? That's the focus of the investigation. We just learned of these cases from our laboratory a handful of hours ago, So our our team of epidemiologists, those disease detectives, are kicking into high gear to get all the facts on these newest cases. We should know more in the the coming days. Okay, and I have a viewer question as well. 
Uh, a viewer wrote to us with a question stating, they noticed on your website data that the coronavirus rate of spread among the 20 to 30 year old group is expanding way faster than other age categories. They said they noticed that about a week ago, the 50 year old group had the highest percentage of infection. Now the 20 year old group has exceeded them by more than 40 cases in a very short time. Is this related to the wedding outbreak or to college testing or what do you believe is going on? Well, uh, Bob, you know, um, I was just about to talk about Labor Day. Uh, and so I'll answer your question and then segue into a discussion about the next couple of days. Uh, and the answer, Bob, is that it's a little bit of all of those things. Uh, there have been a handful of cases now identified amongst uh, college and university students. So that's a contributor. Uh, many of the attendees uh, at the wedding on August 7th in Millinocket were also in that 20 to 40 age bracket, also a contributor. In addition, many of the new cases that have been identified in York County have been among younger people as well, also a contributor. We've also seen decreases in the number of new cases and outbreaks at nursing homes. So on a percentage basis, the number of younger people getting infected has gone up and the number of older individuals who have been exposed and getting infected has gone down. And thus on a percentage basis, the impact of the increase among younger folks is magnified. Uh, which takes me to Labor Day. Uh, many of us are gearing up for Labor Day gatherings and celebrations this weekend. If we have learned nothing about COVID-19 over the past six, week, six months, whether in Maine or from other parts of the country, it has been one thing, COVID-19 likes holidays. It can make an uninvited appearance at just about any backyard gathering, barbecue or brunch that you might have planned this weekend. And I understand that. I mean, let's face it, when we're celebrating with our friends and family, we let our guard down. It's natural to do that. Now, Coming into a weekend like Labor Day in a non-COVID era, my normal message to everybody would be to be careful on the road this weekend, and be careful in the water this weekend. But this year, my message, my ask, is to be careful in your own backyard or in your own front yard or in your own dining room. Because one of the largest threats that we face this holiday, as well as in prior holidays, is COVID-19. As we have learned all too well in Maine over the past three weeks, COVID-19 can crash a party literally where we least expect it. Now, I'll be the first to admit, it has been a cruel summer. Bananarama had it right. And as we look into the unofficial end of the summer, we know that this will mean that there will be a lot of celebrations this weekend. My ask for all of you is to please be doing the same things we've talked about for so many months now. As I mentioned a moment ago, one of the areas in which the science around COVID-19 has coalesced is that two things really set apart the prevention steps that you and your family can take. Wearing a face covering and staying physically distant of at least six feet from everybody around you. Is that easy to do during a celebration or gathering or Labor Day barbecue? No. Is it fun? Absolutely not. Is it a little awkward to be the one person at a barbecue wearing a face covering? Most definitely. I've been there. But I ask you to do it. And I ask you to set the norm where every single event that you might be going to for the next three or four days is one at which everyone is wearing a face covering or that one where everyone is staying at least six feet apart from one another. Doing both of those things, as well as things like washing your hands, can help us get a grip on COVID-19. The honest truth is everyone, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm concerned because Maine has done so well. And I'm concerned that if current trends continue, we might lose our grip on COVID-19. So I'm asking you, as you go into this celebratory weekend, the end of summer, the end of this cruel summer. Please do your part to help us keep a grip on COVID-19. 
of course, a time of celebration, and we and I encourage everyone to do so, but do so in a way that doesn't keep the numbers growing in such a fashion as we've seen recently. At some point, COVID-19 will be behind us. And what I ask everyone to think about this weekend is whether we want Labor Day to be the story that is told about when everything in COVID-19 changed in Maine, about whether we look back on Labor Day in the same way that other states have looked back on Memorial Day or the 4th of July and said, that's when it all went loose. We don't want that to happen here. So please do your part this weekend, help everyone in your family, help everyone in your community stay safe. I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. Thank you all for joining in. As always, please be kind, take care of one another, and we'll talk again on Tuesday.